Is there anybody here who has never seen me before? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anybody here who was not present last evening? Thank you. Anybody who has seen me before? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody seen me more than twice? Thank you. Seen more than five times? <laughs> Ten times? Hundred times? <laughs> you saw me hundred times on the same day, right? <laughs> okay, I'm very happy to be in the midst of friends again to conduct a workshop. Why I wanted to know if you have seen me before is because you know that I say the same thing all over again. And they have tried, these sponsors and organizers of my programs have tried to divert me to something else by giving different titles to my lectures. <laughs> but I've always been able to squirm around. <laughs> the truth is, I don't have anything new to offer. All I say is, go within and get all your answers. The best answer I can give you is, the real answers are within your own self. But what a pity, what an irony, that we know the answers are within, but we don't know how to go with it. So ultimately, all these workshops, lectures, discussions, discussion groups, become a means of developing, perfecting, fine-tuning a process, a method for going with it, a method for knowing oneself, a method of knowing who we really are. Why should this be difficult that we shouldn't know who we really are? Don't we see ourselves in the looking glass, in the mirror? Now you have mirrors all over. You don't have to go outside this room. See? The mirrors in homes, mirrors in cars, mirrors everywhere. So, one can always see who one is. One looks at the face and says, this is me. And then come these enlightened people telling us, are we so temporary? Because the face we see today doesn't remain the same a few days later, a few months later, a few years later. How could we be so temporary? We were very temporary beings here. We keep on changing. And then we die. And we don't know. We've seen people die. We've seen so many of them die. They die every day. Where have they gone? Was that all? They had a short life. Some of them were discussing with us big plans. Ten years later, we are going to do this. Five years later, we are going to do this. And next day, they are not here to do those things. Is that going to happen to us? Is that what the self represents? A self with very limited time, with dwindling capacity to do anything worth achieving? And then getting old and dying, is that all? It's a very saddening thought that so many of us could be mistaken into believing that that is the self. If that were the self, our entire approach to life would be different. We would say we are here on a very temporary visit. Let's make the best of it and run away and get away. But that's not what we are doing. There is a strange feeling in each human being that all these people will die, but I'll still be there to see them die. There is a feeling, a sense of immortality in each one of us that defies description. Even when we see people dying, it doesn't look like that we may die any minute. It looks like we'll probably stay on a little longer. We can do some of the things we have planned. Isn't it strange that? Feeling of immortality should be linked 
with the association that this body is the self. The two don't go together. They have never gone together. That is why it appeals to us if somebody says the real self is within you. This is only a cover. The body is a cover. The real self is within and the real self never dies. If it never dies, it is an immortal source of consciousness and awareness and life, then it is just experiencing life and consciousness and all the sensory perceptions around for a temporary period housed in this body. And after this body goes, it will still be there doing something else. The trouble is, we don't know what else and where. Nobody knows. People keep on discussing, is there life after death? And they want to find the answers about life after death from those who are still in the body. Those in the body don't know what is life after death. They are knowing life before death. Then we go to people we think might be more highly qualified because they have been near death. They went just close to death and came back into the body. We don't know how far they went. They may have just been at the periphery of this body and come back. How can they tell us what will happen when we have no link with the body at all? Those people who have described their experiences of near death, almost dying, dying and coming back, those who have described like that, they have not gone and died permanently and this body was buried, cremated, finished, turned into dust and then they could say without a body to go back to, we can now tell you what the experience is. We don't have that kind of information. But there must be. If the, if the inner self is permanent and so many people have died while we have watched them die, and their inner self is permanent, they must be somewhere. Maybe they never found another body. They may be hovering around. Maybe they have come to this workshop. They might have taken the back chair. <laughs> Maybe they are sitting in our lap. We don't know because they are not in a body. We have no idea what is the form, if any, that these entities have taken who were little while ago, just like us, moving about in a body and all their awareness of the self was the body. If we can really know to our personal satisfaction, to our personal conviction, what it is to be alive without a body, it will solve many problems, would answer many questions. The mystics offer a way to find out who we really are, what we will be like after we die and leave this body. Would you be interested in knowing that method and practicing and finding out what you will be after you die? Anybody interested, please raise your hand. Anybody not interested in this, please raise your hand. Nobody, so all can attend this workshop. We are going to see how we can find out who we really are in this body and what we will be really if we had no body at all. The process is called dying while living. If one can die while living, have the identical experience, then one can know what one is in reality on a long-term permanent basis. Dying while living. The kind of dying, St. Paul says, I die daily. The kind of dying that is practiced by the Eastern mystics who can leave the body at will for as long as they like, go distances away from the body as far as they like, discover life they led before they ever came into this body and find out what is the life after they will leave this body personally, with their own perception. What is self-realization? 
self realization is to realize that self which does not die with the body there is little story which i sometimes use to to provide comic relief when the subject is so serious once upon a time there was a merchant in india who did export and import business he used to export some product to africa and he used to bring back those products of african origin to india he took some silks and garments from india and brought some cashew nuts and other spices from africa so he was in that business but during the course of his business he used to go at least once a year to africa he used to pass through an african jungle which had very beautiful parrots parakeets parrot parakeet whatever you call them you know nice color so he liked those birds so much he decided to bring one back to india so he bought a cage and he captured one of the birds and brought the bird back to india then he fed that bird to chili mexican food the bird was very happy making merry in the cage after a year when the merchant was going back on his next business trip to africa he asked that bird in the cage do you have any message to send to your folks back home because i am going to visit them on this business trip and the bird said yeah tell them i am eating drinking dancing singing laughing and making merry in my cage and i am very happy so the merchant went to africa and during the course of his business he visited that forest and he saw all the other parrots lying around so he stopped and called them he says hey folks come here do you remember i picked up one of you a parrot from here and put in a cage and took that parrot back to india that parrot has sent a message to you and they all gathered and listened to this merchant and he said the parrot says he is enjoying himself in his cage eating drinking singing dancing laughing making merry and is very happy when the merchant said this one parrot sitting on the branch of a tree had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead on the ground the merchant said this parrot must have been a very dear friend of the parrot i took away that he could not bear to hear this message saddened by this event the merchant returned to india and he told the parrot in the cage i gave your message to your folks and i told them you are dancing singing eating drinking making merry laughing and are very happy in your cage but when i said this one of the parrots there got tears in his eyes and fell down dead when the merchant said this the parrot in the cage got tears in his eyes and he fell down dead very saddened that he was a foolish merchant not to realize if these parrots were so close to each other one lost his life the other might lose his life anyway what could he do the parrot was dead so he opened the cage and threw the dead bird out as soon as he did that the bird rose flew and sat on top of a wall and the bird then said you aren't dead after all and the bird said no nor is the other one dead that bird in africa only sent a message to me throw you if you want to get out of this cage die while living <laughs> this story is told to illustrate the point that the escape from the prison of this physical body which confines us to a world of experience which is only physical is possible while we are here while we can verify if it is true or not only by dying while living now what is dying while living if you have seen people die slowly 
in sufficient time for you to watch what happens and if you can talk to them, you will notice that they die in stages. That as the body is losing its strength and dying, a person can still talk to you and the extremities, the hands and the feet are already gone. There is no consciousness. The consciousness seems to disappear gradually in the physical body from the extremities, the hands and feet and grows towards the torso. And even when the torso is beginning to die and a person can say, I don't know if I have any hands, arms, legs. I don't even know if I have a body. The person is still talking. As it advances and goes to the brain, the person is dead, brain dead and can talk and communicate no more. And that body is as good as a lump of dust. So this death of the body in physical terms takes place exactly in a way in which the Eastern mystics found a way they could duplicate it, duplicate the method, and thereby practice the art of dying while living. They noticed that what we call life our consciousness is actually nothing more than the spread out of attention of consciousness in the body. That as the attention from the brain spreads out into the whole of this body, it makes the whole body alive. And as it spreads out into the whole body and the sensory system and the motor systems, it makes the feeling that the body is the sense. As it uses the sensory perceptions and the organs of sense fixed upon the body, the same consciousness peeps out through the nine apertures and gets an experience of the world around itself and that becomes a life. The nine apertures, the two eyes, two nostrils, the mouth, the two ears, two lower orifices, these nine apertures are a contact for a living body a body in which the attention has been scattered to scatter further and make contact with the outside world. In this process, this flow of conscious energy in the form of attention keeps going on continuously in one direction and we are constantly going out to see where is the real world. And that is how this world is so real. And that is why the body is so real. And that is why we identify ourselves with this body. It is the flow of attention that is making this happen. That attention is the key word, the key secret by which this process takes place. That when a person dies, what is really happening is an involuntary withdrawal of attention because of the end of that show which led to the spread of this attention. What if the show has intended? We are still in the body, still in the world. Can we simulate this process of withdrawal of attention? The Eastern mystics say, yes, that is the true meditation. The true meditation is to learn the art of withdrawing attention. The true meditation is not the art of focusing attention on something. If you focus attention on something, you are still outside. If you focus attention on something inside, you are still making that inside outside. I'll explain to you later during the day. To focus attention is to go away from yourself. Whatever you focus attention on anything, whenever attention is focused out, you are out. Whenever attention is focused on something, you are in that thing. Whenever attention is focused on a person, you are in that person, but you are not in the self. The only way to experience the self is to withdraw attention from wherever it is being focused to the self. True meditation is the art of withdrawal of attention to the self. We are going to try and practice it today. Is anybody willing to practice? And, and see if you can die while living? Not too many hand raised now. Okay. No, you can stop any time you like if you don't want to die while living. The withdrawal of attention 
to the self is the only requirement for dying while living. Nothing else is required. If you can withdraw your attention to yourself, you will experience in the same way a loss of consciousness of the extremities of this body. When you withdraw your attention to the self. Now, where is the self? This self we know is in the body. This is the body, the self, the whole self. The whole body is the self. What are we talking about when we say withdrawal of attention from the body to the self? Where is the self? Is it in the tip of his finger? Is it in the back of my eyes? Is it in the heart? Is it in the stomach? Where is it? It depends if one is hungry, it's probably in the stomach. <laughs> if one got a cardiac arrest, it's in the heart. If one is thinking, it's in the head. Depends on what we are functioning. If one is pointing a finger at somebody, it may have gone into the finger. The point is that this self is scattered by attention. And if we give more attention to something, if I give more attention to my hand, more of me is there. But if I want to withdraw from everywhere and go back to where its natural habitat is, where does self, as a conscious energy, as an energy that generates attention, where is that conscious self residing naturally? Not in a state of spreading out, but in a state of withdrawal. The mystic said, you can experiment for yourself and find out where the self is. Relax, be natural, close your eyes and ponder and contemplate, where am I pondering from? In consciousness, where am I aware of? Where is it that I am knowing my body? How come I know my hand is on this side? Where do I know that my hand is on the right side? Where do I know that there is a top of my head? Where do I know from that I have a throat, that I have a body? Where am I thinking all these things? Is it in the hand? No. Is it in the arm? No. By your own contemplation, you will find you are in the head. It doesn't take long. By your own contemplation, you will find that when you are in the fully wakeful state of physical existence, you are in the head. If you are not fully awake in the wakeful state, you are not in the head. If you are semi-asleep at night in bed, you say, well, this fellow said in the lecture in the workshop that you are in the head behind the eyes. Let me try. And before going to sleep, you take your hands and put them on your eyes. Ah, now I know. I am thinking this question. I know where I am. I can put my, my own hands on the front of the eyes and I can know that this thought is coming to me from some place just behind where I'm keeping my, my hands on my eyes. Then you get more sleepy. <clears throat> enough sleep to make you drowsy, but no sleep, not enough sleep to not let you know where the body is. Say, now nah, let me try. I'm just about to sleep and touch my eyes. And you'll touch your nose. Anybody tried this? You tried. That when you want to touch your eyes and you will feel you brought your hand to your eyes, you actually touch your nose. Because that notional point of consciousness, the natural focal point, the natural point of existence of consciousness, which is the energy from where attention is being thrown out, itself shifts depending upon what state of consciousness we are in. Therefore, in the dream state, that center shifts. We are still half awake when we can touch the nose and feel how come we should be touching the eyes? How they have the eyes come down? If we could be aware of our body while dreaming and wanted to touch our eyes, we would touch our throat. Yogis have done it. There is an art of doing that. I am not recommending that to you. But if you want to experiment whether this notional location in the physical body of the self 
shift you will find as the level of wakeful consciousness shifts to a more dream like trance like situation the positioning of what we think is the location of the self what we feel is the location of the self shift downward going right up to the heart and if you are in very deep meditation where you can breathe from the bottom of your abdomen which the yogis have practiced you can even shift it right below to the bottom of the abdomen this movement of the location of consciousness through various stages has enabled yogis to determine many centers or chakra in this body where they can have strange experiences because of the confluence of energies emotional and physical which consciousness and attention meet at these points and therefore they have said a lot about the yoga of the six chakras or the yoga of the seven chakras if they go into wakefulness and they talk of all the energy experiences as if it is a great spiritual experience that is an experience of dreaming sleeping going into various kind of trances fantasizing imagining of many kinds but it is not discovery of the self which survives after death it is not dying while living it is having what they call when they take some acid or mushrooms or something or they having a kick or something trip they having a trip so these yogis have gone into these centers to have a trip you can have as many trips as you like we have lots of trips here somebody told me can you fly without your body I said yes i did when i was a child so why don't you do it now said, because i can afford airplane tickets now <laughs> how does it matter a trip is a trip it is not self realization let's not mix up these experiences however wonderful however strange however unconventional however extraordinary they are not self realization they are just trips just for the kick of it we are talking of self realization discovery of that true nature of the self which is permanent and never disappears has no connection with the life of this body to to be able to discover that we must withdraw our attention no lower than the physical level of wakefulness if we lower it below the physical level of wakefulness it becomes a dream dreams come and we wake up and the wake awakened reality looks always more real than the dream even if the dream is so extraordinary we have to go and tell people look we had a wonderful dream i have never seen a person who has seen this physical world say tomorrow i am going to tell people my friends in the dream what i have seen here because they know dream is a dream those people are unreal created by my own mind why should i go and tell them what i saw here but when i see extraordinary things in the dream i'll come up here and tell people in the physical world i had a great experience more real than this i saw reality and is telling those people who obviously are more real than the reality that person saw such is the deception we play upon ourselves thinking that we have got something great because it was unusual an unusual novel experience does not make it an experience of self realization self realization comes when we are more awake than we are now not less and how can we be more awake we should not let the natural center of consciousness in this body drop below where we are now right now we can experience we can contemplate ponder go over the spectrum of consciousness and see where are we spreading ourselves from and by a natural process of introspection and study within ourselves we can find we are behind the eyes when we close our eyes we can know there's darkness the darkness is mostly outside why is it dark because we closed our eyes otherwise it looked lighted we are so used to seeing through these eyes 
that even when we close our eyes, we are not inside. We haven't gone within. We are still in the same outside. Just by closing the eyes and creating darkness does not mean we have gone within. Our attention is still focused on the darkness outside of the body, not inside. Therefore, a meditation that is only dependent upon closing the eyes and peering out into the darkness never leads to withdrawal of attention to the self. Therefore, this withdrawal of attention to the self at the wakeful state must follow the same procedure which we get in actual physical death. In that process, we will, if we are focusing our attention exactly on where the attention is being scattered from, if we are going back to where we are going out from, the process will be that we will feel the loss of consciousness in our hands and extremities. We will feel we don't have the hands after a while. Where are they? Did I put them like this or like this? In the process of meditation, we not know where the feet are. As this goes on gradually, and even before we reach that point, the process of withdrawal is such, we can start having those experiences of seeing our body from outside while we are still here. Because we will for the first time realize that the process of seeing, looking, is not dependent upon the optic nerve or these eyes. That seeing goes on independently of these eyes. Since we always thought we saw with these eyes, we thought we left the body and we've gone somewhere else. We can go nowhere, be in the body and see this body from outside. And we can have that experience much before we have reached the withdrawal of attention to the eye center behind the eyes from where we are operating. Near death experiences are really not experiences away from the body, even though the person sees the body away from itself. Because the process of seeing is separated temporarily. But the body is still holding on to the life, to the life force, the soul, the spirit. Consciousness is still there. And that is why it's operating around that body. As we proceed further, when we are really at the eye center, the whole body is dead and we can move freely wherever we like. There is no silver cord pulling us back. There is no connection with this body. We are not doing an astral projection from the body. We have found ourselves that was housing this body. And we are keeping the body alive by our connection with the body because it is dying while living. The whole process is still taking place in the point behind the eyes in the state of wakefulness. It has shifted from there slightly higher in the head, still in the body, and we are able to experience a flight anywhere we like. We can proceed further with the body with which we are flying, with which we have released ourselves. At least for the first time we got a chance to see what we look like when we are not in this body. Some of you may be disappointed to know that we look almost the same, even without the body. Because what is a carry forward of the image of our self other than the physical self, what we call the astral self, the ethereal self, the fine self, that carry forward is nothing but the sensory perceptions of this body, what we are experiencing now. Now we are able to use these five senses of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. These very senses which we think are dependent upon the physical structure of this body and the nervous system, these senses are in fact operating independently because of the astral body housed in this one. And even when we are dead in this body, all these five functions are retained fully and move out. You can see as well, in fact, better. So when you can see, touch, taste and smell, the feeling is we are exactly the same, just moving around. But we are invisible. If we wanted to know what we look like, we look like the same, but we are invisible. But we can see those who are not invisible. And then later on we find the art of seeing the so-called physically invisible beings who are in astral form. And we see their astral forms, which are very similar to this form. Sometimes we see that the astral form 
of a human being is bigger. They don't have any dieting or I don't know. Lose, lose weight classes. The trouble there is, the size is bigger, but there is no weight. The astral body has no weight. Therefore, it can fly. There is no gravity to pull it down. It can see through. Its eyes are not blocked by matter. You put matter in the middle, it can still see through behind it. It can fly at infinite speed. It can fly at the speed of thought. It has several characteristics which are remarkable. But we realize that those very characteristics of the astral form or the sensory form or the form that retains all the senses but does not retain the body, that very form has been responsible for what we call the life in this body and made us feel this is the self. Therefore, we get a clue by this process of dying while living that there is a self that can move out as its independent existence and is not dependent upon this body. Not only that, when we look at that body and when we examine and experience that body, we realize the body was there even before we were born. What happens when you come to know that you were there before you were born? You remember. The memory comes back. The memory comes back who you were, what you were before you were born in this body. And also you find out that if you came for a short trip from the astral body to make a short trip in the physical, what are you going to do next? You find out the truth of your life beyond death. And you know in what form you are going to go ahead. And you can see a world in which these decisions are made. And you see your life and you remember your birth and your life and your death in that body. And that is not coterminous with this one. Stretch is way beyond this. A thousand years, two thousand years, depends on individual. So here is a self that has a much longer time span. It has its own birth, own death. And during the time span of a thousand, two thousand years, it may go into one body, to two bodies, may reincarnate again and again, may take ten bodies, may take different forms. But after taking all these forms and fulfilling its purpose, through karma, having fulfilled its purpose, it dies. If it dies, it is not the self. So we are left where we were with all this dying while living. We thought we found our permanent self. We did find our self that is more real, more long-lasting than this one. But we did not find the true self which is immortal. Therefore, we are often confused that we found our soul. But how can soul die? What we found still dies or still born. It's born, lives. Inhabits physical bodies, goes back into astral form, goes back into heavenly styles, and then again dies. What good is that? It may be a great experience. It may be an elevated experience. It may be a higher level of consciousness. It may be entry into a higher world which governs the laws of this world. We may be able to find all the things that we need to know about the nature of this creation. But we have not found the self. We found a somewhat higher self, a somewhat more true self than the one we thought was the self, something more real than the physical, but not the truth. What then should we do? What is this prescription after this by the doctor, which means a perfect living man? The prescription is the same. Go within. Now go within where? Go within the astral body. Go within the body that is giving you all the sensory experience. When you withdraw your attention, you will notice that the entire experience of the astral self of the sensory system is based upon scattering of attention. Consciousness spreading itself out in time and space and making all this experience possible. When that happens, you withdraw attention from all sensory experience to the center of the self in that body. And that happens, you withdraw attention from senses 
and you find the senses are no longer necessary to be alive and conscious. And when senses are shut down, like this body was shut down temporarily, when the senses are temporarily shut down and are no longer ne necessary for life, you find you are still alive, more alive, because your thought, your mind goes beyond the sense. That what you thought were concepts, what you thought were just an idea, the ideas were not ideas or thoughts, they were reality of a higher order than the physical or the astral. That the mind in its universal field, which is the causal state from where all things were born, including all sensory experiences, that that particular way of looking at creation gives you a real understanding of how senses came into being. Why you sense in a particular way? Why should you have five senses, not ten or twenty? Why not two? What was the nature of creation? You run into an area of knowledge which is not dependent upon sensory perception. You get into what is commonly referred to as the Akashic record. The records from everything is born. You get into an area of knowledge where you can traverse time forward and backward at will at infinite speed. You can go back as much as you like. If you can go back and see your own history a million miles away, a million years away, a million light years away and a million years away, and if you can see it forward, there is no limit. So you are sure now you have found your true self. Still, you can spend enough time there and find that there is a beginning of that stage itself. That time itself is created, it's spurred. That there is a timelessness, a strange kind of timeless nothingness in which the whole of this exploded experience of time and space is just one spurt of manifestation. Even if it is millions of years, billions of years, it still has a beginning, a middle and an end. And when the whole system came up, you came up with it. You are permanent in that system. But when the whole system collapses, you collapse with it. Therefore, what comes with the system and what collapses with the system could not be real because it is not immortal. Therefore, you have found your causal, your universal your ultimate mental self, but you have not found your true, permanent, immortal self. This causal stage is the highest stage any of the yogis and swamis ever reached, and they called it the ultimate, the permanent stage. It is extremely rare, it has been extremely rare historically to find any human being who, while he was a human being, and while he was in the same body like ourselves, could have attained a state higher than this. Because that state has all the characteristics of finality. It is the universal mind. It is in infinite. You last as long as the whole creation there lasts. And that creation lasts forever, it seems. But it is tied to time and space. And therefore, it has a certain finiteness even after infinity. Therefore, even reaching the top of creation, you have still not found the self. That's very disappointing. Universal self and universal mind and discovering the real nature of the Akashic record and how we picked up our own tapes from there and how we are the makers of our destiny because we chose the life we are leading here. We find all the secrets. How we chose what we are going through how the programmed version came up and how what was our role, the role of the individuated self, the role of our universal mind and the individuated self in picking up the sensory package, the physical package and the package of life we are living now. All these answers come from within at that stage and yet we have not found our true self. What we have reached is still thought. What we have reached is still imagination. What we have reached is still a play of the mind. 
it's the highest skill meant what we have reached does not include some strange feelings we have while we are still here such as the feelings of love we didn't talk about it it was neither physical nor sensory nor mental nor thinking where does that come from what's the role of love we have talked of the spontaneous timeless intuition the hunch where does that come from we have talked of the wonder of sudden beauty that dawns upon us where does that come from we we haven't been able to explain that we are experiencing it right here in the physical world we have found the origin of the entire universe and not found the origin of these experiences we are having as a human being those experiences are coming from the self which we have not yet discovered these experiences are coming from that self which is not bound by time even if it is infinite time what do we do next there is hardly a teacher you will come across even with the best of luck in this world even in a century i presume who could take you beyond the universal mental level it will be difficult even to find a teacher taking you to that level but to find one who pierces that level and takes you beyond universality extremely rare to tell you the truth i have not even been able to find too many teachers talking about it leave aside taking us there their talk ends here as the end but that is not the self because it is not permanent what do we do next ask the perfect living master the mystic adept who has crossed that stage himself and is still in the body after having experienced it ask him he'll give the answer what answer does he give the perfect living master says what you have seen is a causal world it causes all that you can see possibly it's the creator of all these worlds but is not yourself the self lies above that so pierce that now how do we pierce that same prescription go within go within what go within your mental body go within your physical form go within your mind the mind the causal body the mental body are the same thing we use these different words in different contexts they are the same identical thing when you go within your mind you can actually withdraw attention from thoughts now please understand this is a deep thing when you withdraw attention from thoughts you are in fact withdrawing attention from time and space thoughts survive only in time and space thoughts cannot occur they need that framework when you withdraw attention from thoughts from the causal self you are actually withdrawing your attention from time and space and going to a spiritual self of your own which is the creator of time and therefore permanent the permanency does not depend upon the time it depends upon the fact it is beyond time the permanency is not linked how long it lived the permanency is it lived before how long was invented therefore when you can withdraw from the mind and time and space into the permanency of the spirit you discover a flow of love which is your basic nature the basic nature of the self is love it overflows it is the creator love its expressions in any form whether physical sensory mental spiritual or total its manifestations are a manifestation of that permanence of the permanence of that creator of the spirit of the soul which is our real self only when one can go beyond the brahma the brahma that created the brahma that is the causal self when one can go to par brahma beyond brahma can one say i have found who i am you cannot claim to have had self realization till you have gone to that state that's the first time the human soul can say now i know who i am Be- before that it is all a cover that we are trying to see these are different covers whether this body 
or sensory body or causal body or mind these are all covers upon the self and the self shines with one strong attribute the attribute of love that attribute flows right through up to the physical body we don't know where it comes from we don't know that the thoughts come from the causal that the senses come from the astral that the physical loco locomotion motors come from the physical matter that love still comes from the spirit from the real form of the self we forget it but it's happening every day now in this process of going within we can find these truth for our self not for somebody else not that somebody else has to see the experience and say i can tell you it is there and believe me don't believe the perfect living masters have said a great thing they said do not believe even the gurus even the masters even the perfect living masters unless you experience yourself they lay so much store on personal experience that only believe that what comes to you personally and not because somebody says because when you go by somebody saying something you can be mistaken therefore go to that level when you can find your own self does the journey end or is there something more after this what i said should mean that when you gone beyond brahm and you found yourself you crossed all these delusions all the illusion delusion being to mistake the cover for the self to mistake my jacket or my sweater that this is me instead of saying this is my sweater if i start calling it me that's the delusion we have been through delusion thinking the body is the self we have been through delusion thinking that i am looking i am doing this i am touching i am tasting i am smelling this i i is deluding itself by thinking the senses are the self the i is deluding itself by thinking the thoughts are the self these are attachments to the self they are clothes being worn by the self they just like garments which we can change at will but the self that we have now found in truth that should end the spiritual journey and we have had a, a type of highly evolved perfect mystics perfect living mystics in the east who were called sad gurus as against gurus they were called sad gurus the gurus of the highest realization and those sad gurus had reached that stage which i just described and they said unless you reach that stage you have not had self realization nor have you found the real creator of all this show which is yourself in that form but there have been rarely once in a while gurus that went beyond the sad gurus very rare we call them sat gurus the real true gurus and those are so rare it's difficult to know what's the difference between the sad gurus and the sat gurus the sat guru or the true guru is the one who can point out to the last illusion of the sat guru's experience now what illusion can be there be we found the very source of consciousness which creates everything that we know of which has created all the eras we know of has created age after age age after age for billions of years and forever we found out the source of infinite time how can there be anything left of an illusion after that the sat gurus came like ordinary human beings sitting in a body like our and experiencing this going within they went within that individuated soul the individuated spirit which created all this and found the last illusion which they could remove what was the last illusion individuation there is no such thing as individuation that to feel that you are an individual is itself an illusion and they discovered that their reality at all times was the totality of consciousness and creation it never split they found out that consciousness has always been total it has never been split that when it looked like it's individuated that individuation taking place in pure spirit itself is illusion but that illusion then goes on all the way right up to here when we say how many of us are sitting here well 50 60 are here 100 are here are we really 100 those with some inkling of truth say no no really we are one 
how are we one? We look different, we talk different, we fight with each other. We don't have any real experience of being one. We don't even have that experience of being one when we go to astral stage. We don't have experience of all being one even when we go to causal stage. We don't even have the experience of being one even when we are pure spirits. We still think we are so many spirits. The Satguru removes the illusion by going within that spirit. Going within still and finding that the truth was, the individuation was a creation of the totality to experience creation in a certain way. This is the drama of life. That the totality of consciousness, which is one undivided being, has never been split, can never split, has created illusion after illusion to the point that we have come to this physical world and we are searching a way back to the same form. Do you think the totality of consciousness made a great mistake? To spread itself out so thin and then say, now each individual part that have been created in illusion, now you find out what the truth is. What a game to play. To say, I am living in permanent single harmony, in single peace, in single permanence, joy, happiness, love, that's my real characteristic, I am staying forever, but now let me have a little trip into land of misery and disease and holocaust and all the problems that are there. What kind of trip was that? Would you do it? Would any one of you do it? Well, if the truth is what I am stating, you did it. You all did it. Because you are not all, you are one. The one did it. The one became the many. Was there anything wanting, lacking? There could be nothing lacking in totality. Then what part of totality triggered off this creation in which all this had to be experienced? Some people give a naive answer, but it has some little bit of truth, but very difficult to understand at this level. But I will still share it with you. The naive answer, which has some element of truth, is that if you are really only one, you must be pretty lonely. Don't you feel you need some company? Don't you feel the oneness itself? The onlyness? The onlyness of existence? The onlyness of creator? What would the creator do if that's the only creator? Only one creator by itself? What would such a creator do? Create, obviously. Create what? Create anything that would substantiate itself as a creator. A creator would not be a creator without creation. Therefore, a creator creation setup would be permanent. The permanence of the creator-creation relationship would make that the creator and the rest the creation. What about consciousness? Why create? Where consciousness has to be conscious of something to be conscious. Even if it is conscious of itself, it has to have something to be conscious of. If consciousness does not have anything to be conscious of, it is not conscious. It doesn't exist. So for very existence, consciousness, has to be conscious of, of what? Anything it likes, because the only thing existing. Therefore, consciousness existing per se and conscious of itself can be itself in any form it likes. And all these are forms of consciousness right up to here. It is the forms being taken by a single consciousness. And all the forms, the more they go into delusion after delusion, Strengthen the reality of the ultimate consciousness. Otherwise, if there is only consciousness, what is reality? In what way are, do we use the word real? Have we ever used the word real except to distinguish it from the unreal, from the illusion? If there is no illusion, what is real? And if something is real, something else makes it an illusion, the other thing is more real. So we go into a strange kind of experience of relative reality, levels of reality, levels of consciousness, levels of illusion. One illusion making the other look like reality. We go into a dream state, the dream is real, 
we wake up the dream becomes an illusion and waking up becomes reality we go within to the astral stage the waking up becomes an illusion and the astral stage becomes absolute reality we rise further the astral stage becomes a dream illusion and the causal becomes a reality and so on and so on and the whole thing is sustained by these levels of consciousness and levels of reality at one time we are in one level therefore we know this is real wherever we are if we are dreaming that is real if you dream within a dream and wake up into the dream the second dream was unreal the second the first one is still real we had the dream sometimes in the dream you go to sleep again and then you wake up in the dream say wow that was a strange nightmare thank god i am awake till you wake up again and say that was in really waking that was another dream but when you wake up you don't question this one now i know i am awake why because you haven't woken up any further these experiences of the mystic of going within are a successive way of waking up again and again to higher and higher form of our own reality ultimately we find the truth and the ultimate reality i call it ultimate reality from this standpoint from the physical where we are sharing with each other we are sharing an experience with each other and finding out a direction towards ultimate reality which we can pursue and find right now without having to have blind faith on somebody's word it will happen later on to die while living we can have all these experiences i have shared with you a spiritual journey of infinite possibility i have made it sound that you could have this whole experience in 5 minutes and come back and say yeah you were right we went and saw the ultimate people have spent hundreds of years at each of these stages thousands of years millions of years we have spent millions of years in these stages and we can recall when we go there time is a different thing there our sense of time here is all confined to this level it's not a synchronized time running in all these places we're creating time with our experience we have picked up a particular tape you might say a cassette tape from the akashic records and come down and are playing it well those who are sitting here i must say were lucky they picked up a tape which provided for going back otherwise you wouldn't even think of it why would somebody get into a situation which involves pain and suffering opposite and not have the ability to get, get out of it so it was good that we picked up tape with a certain provision or we made some other arrangement if i were to get locked out of my own house i try to make sure i keep my key with me i i wouldn't do like this that i lock myself out and throw the key in and say there i go forever lost forever i wouldn't like to be lost forever therefore if the ultimate is creating this experience for itself for himself or herself whatever success if it has any if the ultimate consciousness the ultimate creator has created all these levels right up to the level where we are now sitting and finding a way back surely the ultimate did not throw the key back and got itself shut out forever must have brought the key with it what was that key the key is the appearance of the perfect living master in our midst the key is the connection with the force of consciousness the energy of consciousness at all levels retaining its quality of the self let me explain this little further when we go to sleep and have a dream do you know that even while dreaming we may become different we still know we can still say i am dreaming or i am seeing this or i am doing this supposing in a dream we become like a bird and fly out of the window if we have an actual dream in which we become a bird and fly out of a window and then we wake up and we tell our friends what dream we had we won't say 
in the dream i saw a bird flying out of a window we will say in the dream i flew out of a window doesn't the friend have a right to question you don't have feathers you are not a bird how can you talk like this so but actually flew what do you mean by you actually flew you were sleeping no but i was sleeping i was unconscious of this body but in the dream i actually flew as a bird which means even when the form becomes that of a bird the self the i remains the same never change it's a very significant point if you went into a higher region on a astral trip or a spiritual trip or a journey into higher region and got into the astral stage where this body doesn't exist your form changes you got into causal form where there is no form of this kind at all where the form is so vague in its delineation nothing to relate to this form which is based upon senses if you were to go there you would know it's the same me who was there what would be the connection between the two the self remains the same the consciousness retains its identity as a self not as the form the form can keep on changing but the self remains the self you can say i was the self who was so and so and i was the self who was that body and i am the self that is the spirit and i was the self that was that bird in the dream the self has never changed we never experience the self as somebody else we experience the self as the self in any body whatsoever in any kind of form whatsoever that's the link what is the secret of this link very few people know it i have questioned lot of people do you know the secret how this self persists in any form you can't get out of it even if you go into delusion after delusion into dream after dream after dream you still have the same self dreaming and the same self assuming a role in the dream which is still the self that self revolves around itself the dream the illusion but never destroying itself the consciousness that picks up the experience of a dream of a wakeful state of a higher state of the ultimate is the same self it never changes the identity of the self never changes in any form in any experience at any level what is the what is the cause of that what is the nature of that consciousness that can flow like this and irrespective of change in the consciousness in its form or in its experience it still remains the same can we give it a word to that link continuous link at any level i don't know if anybody has given it a word but mystics saints perfect living masters sadgurus satgurus they have called it by a word they try to use a word for sharing this knowledge with us that there is this link that goes all the way to every level of consciousness what word did they use for want of any other word they called it the word anybody familiar with this st john's gospel in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god all things were made by him and nothing was made that was not made by him. that word consciousness its translation in every other known language of the world is identical the word naam shabad subud tao you can call it by any name in any language of the world it is literally the word how come what is this word is a spoken word could not be if it, if it is god the creator how can it be spoken word we keep on changing our spoken word all the time every language in the world has a history you can trace back few thousand years not even we don't know any language spoken a million years ago and yet there is a word which created time a word that created the creator a word that created all creators a word that sustains us at every level of creation what kind of word is that this unspoken word it can be heard but not spoken you can listen to it but not speak it and that gave another big clue to the process of going within 
if the word is a continuous connection between every level of consciousness, what if we got hold of the word? What if the word could be grasped? And we are going to go into it, how a word can be grasped, that word, not the spoken word. How if we could grasp the word, which is the spirit, the ultimate spirit, ultimate consciousness, this strand of consciousness that never splits anywhere, that never breaks, even in going from reality to illusion, it remains the same reality. The only real link at all levels of creation, at all levels of consciousness, if that word we could somehow get hold of and grasp, what would happen? The perfect living masters say, then your journey is very easy. Then you are riding the royal road. Then you are following a system which can be called the system of Shrut Shabd Yoga. The attention pinned on to the word going on its ultimate journey. You don't need anything else. Forget all meditation. Forget everything. If you can do this, you need nothing else. You need no more direction. You need no more meditation. You need no more methods or practices or procedures. If you can get hold of that word, the Shabbat, and stick to it, it goes from stage to stage and you have to do nothing but to live in its company. That word seems to be the secret. If we could somehow get on to the word, we have found the real way. And then come these perfect living masters and they say, don't look at us with so much intensity. What you are looking at is only an external manifestation, an external symbol. Look at our reality. You want to know who a perfect living master is? Where his knowledge comes from? Where he shares his secrets with you? You want to know that? His real form is the word, not the body, not the face, not the form. Go back and find the reality of the nature of a perfect living master that is the word resounding in you all the time, day and night, from birth to death and never stops. You can hear it. You can speak it. This gave a great clue to the old Eastern mystics who were meditating to find the truth. They found there is such a big difference between speaking and listening. That was a great revelation that the whole difference between not getting within and getting within was speaking and listening. If you speak, you never go within. If you listen, you always go within. They found that the speaking part in a human consciousness is done by the mind. You never speak except with the mind. And the listening part is done by the soul, by the spirit, which is beyond mind. It looks so simple that people wondered why we didn't do it. They said, this is so easy. We don't have to speak anymore. We just listen and we are in. That was true. But when they tried to listen and not speak, they found there was constant speech going on in their head. They tried to sit in meditation and somebody was saying in their head, how long will it last? How long have I to do it? I forgot to do that thing. I remember I had something else left over. Boy, that was their own mind. It was speaking incessantly, never allowing us to listen. We found that the very mind that speaks outside through spoken language was speaking through its own spoken language inside us and prevented us from listening. If we could not listen to the mind and just listen to anything else, we would be wonderful, fine. We could find the self. I tell you today that if we don't listen to the mind, sit quietly with our eyes closed, do not listen to the mind and to listen to whatever else is there, you made it, found yourself. But the mind doesn't stop speaking. The mind keeps on speaking. But what happens if for a moment, we can shell the mind aside. What will happen? Will there be something to listen to at all? Yes, you listen to beautiful music, a melody the like of which you have never listened to outside. The force of all music 
is ringing in us at all times. The sound of bell, the chime, that great echo of the bell, of the peal of the bell, gong, gong, going on inside, is going on in each one of us at all times. Why don't we listen? Because we are busy listening to our own thoughts and our own minds. If we could stop listening to our mind and start listening to the sound, the unstruck sound, the unspoken sound, the word that nobody has spoken but resounds continuously. If we can listen to that, we can go through all the five stages of the journey I mentioned up to the ultimate only by listening to the sound. As easy as that. What's making it difficult? The babbling of the mind. Nothing else is making it difficult. We don't have any adversary in the spiritual path except our own mind. There is nobody stopping us on the way except our own mind. If we could just ignore our mind, handle it, somehow do something to it, fight it, handle it, tactfully deal with it, put it aside, give it a lollipop, do something, make it busy. If we could make the mind get busy with something and give us a chance to listen, we made it. This is the secret. The perfect living masters who have gone through this process so many times, they fly in and out to all the stages all the time. They stay in a state of totality where they can operate at simultaneously at all levels of reality and illusion. When we come across such people and they want to share their simplest form, the royal road to the ultimate, they say, just listen to the music, the sound that is always available inside you. You don't have to go anywhere outside. What did we do? The sound was heard by the mystics and they proclaimed, hear it. We built big dome. They said, it is round. Don't you know where the reality is? And we copied this little head of ours, make a bigger dome. Still bigger. We have a bigger church, more following. Bigger dome. And people wore different headgear, mixed people. And we put bells and ring them inside there. That was an outside symbol. That can't lead us within. If we keep on uh, making artificial sounds of the bells outside, how will we hear the bell inside? The bells ring within all the time, 24 hours. Anybody can go and hear within. The bells are ringing in, our, in us all the time. And they are not ringing very far away. They are ringing at the astral stage. The moment you would draw your attention, and it comes above the torso, you will hear the bell. Everybody has heard the bell. They heard the bell sound, whether they were born in China, or they were born in India, or they were born in Sweden, or they were born in the United States. They heard the same bell. It was not man-made. No man invented a machine and implanted in the brain. It was made by the same creator who made us. That sound, that word, that ultimate form, manifestation of the creator, not manifestation of the creation, is inside us at all levels, wherever we go. Therefore, a lot of the practices that we are doing, and we call it meditation, and we call it the great discipline of a spiritual journey, is just to achieve this end. How to stop listening to the mind and start listening to the music. That's it. Whoever has done it has been successful on the spiritual path and makes it. Any one of you can do it. 